coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. It struck a tree about 30-ish, 30 to 50 feet away from me. Imagine someone grabbed your hair and someone grabbed your feet and suddenly pulled the other way really abruptly. That was what my whole whole body did. Everything, every muscle convulsed. And then there was just the loudest noise. It was not even like, when you have like an explosion, your ears are ringing that, it, you know, it didn't even process that it was loud. It was just, my ears were just ringing and ringing and ringing. And then I was just shaking. And, and I, at first I thought it was just cold. It was super cold. I, I wasn't. That was Grant Breidenbach taking us into what it felt like to get struck by lightning. This one is jam-packed with great stories and tips for your next trail adventure. Welcome to The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Quick and easy way to support this podcast is by clicking through our sponsors' websites. And right now, you can click through and check out Bear Vault bearvault.com. We're going to dig into it today a little bit, uh, some of the details uh, that align with packing your bag. But if you head over right now to bearvault.com, you'll find out the best and safest way to protect your gear, uh, to keep it away from critters, bears, and all sorts of other animals. Grant Breitenbach walks us through the gear and steps to going ultralight on your next hiking adventure. We find out how He's got, uh, he's able to do a week-long backpacking adventure with a 12-pound backpack. Yes, that's 12 pounds, and uh, this is amazing. We get into that today. We get into all the new gear and tips on packing the right food. Plus, we find out which is the number one resource you should be checking out to uh, get a hold of some of this gear. We walk through a lot of it today, talk about some of the, the pads and everything else that goes in, but uh, we talk about some resources as well. You're going to have no excuses to get out on the trail and get back into the backcountry uh, after this one. So uh, so let's let's get rolling. Here we go. Grant Breitenbach from BearVault.com. How you doing, Grant? Doing great. So glad to be back on the podcast. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming on here. This has been a lot of fun. We've got a few things that we've done in the past. I'll put some links out to that. Um, you know, as far as Bear Vault, you're one of the leaders. In fact, we saw you out there. I think I let you know we were uh, driving through the city kind of a smaller town or whatever. And there was somebody that had a bear vault on top of their pack. And we drove by, we, we yelled out, Hey, bear vault. And it was pretty sweet because <laughs> they, they gave a big, a big wave and everything. So you guys are, oh, I mean, this perfect. bear vault, I think for a lot of people already know about you, but I think today we're going to focus on maybe some of the people that, you know, aren't totally aware of what you offer. We'll, we'll, we'll put that in the links and then we're going to dig in deeper today about getting people on the trail. Yeah. I think there's really something I think there's really something for everybody in here today. You know, if, if you don't know about bear canisters, I think, you know, I think you'll learn something. And even if you, you might consider yourself a bit of a pro user, I think there's, there's some tips and tricks that, that you'll be able to extract from, from our conversation today and, and really uh, elevate your packing to the next level. Perfect. I love that. I love that because I'm, I've done a lot of backpacking over my time and, uh, and I haven't done a lot recently. So I'm excited about this because there's a lot of different packs and sizes of packs and how to pack and write all this stuff. So we're going to, we're going to break it down to make it really simple today. So, so like we said, uh, bearvault.com, if anybody wants to check this out, essentially you guys offer a really good solution. If you're in like bear country or you have a lot of wild animals around, you need to protect your food, which, you know, if you've ever been out in bear country or even, um, I guess now I, we we did an episode recently. We had some people down in Florida, and they were talking about alligators. Have you guys ever had? Has alligators ever come? Is that something that you guys are ever thinking about? You know, you're not the first person that's mentioned that. Um, you know, alligators. We haven't done a lot of research there, but the reality is, is surprisingly, Florida, a place a place with alligators, is is bear habitat. Um, we've had oh, wow. actually quite uh, quite a bit of bear activity down in Florida and had some canisters munched on down there. And, Amazing. and really there is, there's a thriving black bear population down in that state. That is really cool. That just shows you how little that, uh, you know, I knew and probably a lot of people don't really uh, realize that. So there you go. So bear, you guys are over there too. So, well, let's just start off from the top. I think today what we want to do is break down, um, you know, how to pack a bag, how to be efficient. And let's take it somebody that's maybe doing a two day trip. They're heading out in the back country you know, they've probably got some packable fly rods and some gear like that. They're going to be camping. So talk about that first. What's the first thing to think about if you're heading out for a multi-day trip and, uh, and you want to get the stuff and pack efficiently? Where do you start somebody? Yeah, really start with two things. First, your pack. Um, you probably already have your pack. And what you're going to want to do is figure out how 
your bear canister fits inside that. Um, you know, we've talked before, you go back in the episodes, it's really important, first and foremost, that you're carrying a bear canister. Um, you're not always going to be there to defend your food, whether even if that's not bears, that could be, um, you know, yeah. mice, rodents, yeah. uh, that could be disease vectors or or just, you know, a lot of different animals out there that would love to have a bite of your food, and it's your responsibility to protect them. So you're going to want to figure out how that canister fits into your bag. Bags come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, you know, you go back 10, 15 years, and our biggest size could probably fit horizontally in just about any backpacking bag. But, you know, the, the fabrics and the technologies have come a long ways and bags are tending to get a little bit smaller now. Hmm. Um, so a lot of gear, you know, stoves are getting smaller, sleeping oh, bags right. are packing smaller. So naturally the, the bags are getting smaller, but canisters still have to be um, on the bigger side, A, because they need to fit your food and B, they're a very specific size to fit the size of a bear's jaw so that a bear cannot crush it. Mm, um, right. And so really it's important to uh, fit the canister in there and you you know you might want to stop by your local outfitter um and try three four different sizes and see how they fit in um you know we have our largest size the bv500 which if you're just going out for two days is probably overkill okay. anyway but it might not fit horizontally in the pack um you might want to step down to our next smallest size the bv475 um, I mean, you can ultimately put just about any size vertically in a pack or strap it on top. Okay. But the most comfortable spot to have it that really balances your your load in your pack is kind of right in the lumbar zone, um, horizontally placed. Because what we see often is folks will pack everything, right? They'll get the fly rod in the bag. They'll get the sleeping bag in there, tent. You know, everything gets filled up the bags just about stuffed, right? Because it's the classic, yep. you know, if you buy a big bag, you're going to find a way to fill it. If you buy a small That's bag, right. you'll you'll learn how to make some sacrifices. <laughs> There's a lot that it's about your time, right? If you have, if you give yourself, you know, for some task, it's the same thing, right? You, you say, okay, I've got a, this deadline. If you give yourself a week, it's, it'll take you a week. But if you give yourself two hours, you're going to do it in two hours. Same with packing, right? <laughs> you'll do it in two hours. There's something innate about human nature with with the resources you have. And so what happens, though, is a lot of folks will, will kind of walk up to their bag with their canister and say, oh, shoot, this doesn't fit after they've already packed. So it's really a good place to start. Um, so you want to yeah. think about, about you know, the length of trip, um, the pack you have, and ultimately, which I think we're going to kind of dive into is, is what kind of cook are you? How do you, how do you like to eat out right. there? And that, that honestly has the biggest impact. Yeah. That's right. That's okay. So, so basically, yeah, you got your gear, you got your sleeping bag, your tent, that's the basic stuff. Let, let's just talk about the packing really quick, just for somebody who hasn't, you know, you know, and the thing we can add here is potentially, you know, we're going to have talk about adding a fly rod, which breaks down a reel. There's some other little things, but that could just go in your little stuff sack and throw in there. But what's the first thing is, is the, is the sleeping bag, the thing that goes down at the bottom of your pack? So when you think about packing a bag, uh, a sleeping bag at the bottom is great because you don't um, want the your heaviest weight too low in the pack. That can kind of pull you um, pull you down, especially if you're navigating tougher terrain. We also don't want it way high up either. You know, if you have one of the some of the heavier objects, naturally, um, all of your food um, is going to be probably the heaviest item in your bag, um, especially if you're out there for a few days. And if you put that way up above your shoulders, that's actually, actually pretty unwieldy. You know, if you're kind of climbing over a rock, scrambling down to the bank of a river, um, that could get you pretty off balance. So the key is, is kind of middle of your back and as close to your body as possible for the heavier um, objects. And the lighter something gets, the yep. farther away you can get from your back. So your fly rod, right, this pack down, it weighs just about nothing. That can be, you know, all the way out, you know, maybe even dangling off the back of your pack. But um, the sleeping bag is, is light, right? It's fluffy. When it gets compressed, it's actually pretty heavy. So it's good to have that near the bottom. You know, it's kind of the the item maybe second closest to your body, you know, and then maybe above that canister, you put your tent, you know, that nylon wraps up pretty tight, gets pretty heavy. Um, you know, I love to pack clothing um, and socks and underwear and all those things kind of into the little nooks and crannies and kind of fill in, yeah. uh, fill in kind of the empty space. And then I sort of work down into the smaller, lighter or more fragile items as I kind of work out, but I kind of start right in like the lumbar of my back and work out from there. Oh, so the lumbar, right. So you would start, so instead of just stuffing, you know, start, just start 
down at the bottom and working your way up, you actually focus like your food, for example, like the the bear vault, which would have a lot of food in it, potentially all your food, that would go right against mid midway and kind of against your back. And then you could pack everything around that. Is that kind of how you would look at it? Precisely. If I'm taking one of the bigger canisters, um, a bear vault 475 or bear vault, bear vault 500, basically if I'm out there for four, five days or more, I'm going to put that right at, at kind of the small uh, or the lumbar of the back. If if I am going out for just one night and I'm taking a really small canister, I'm actually going to put that a little higher from my back. I'll probably put that just below my uh, just below my shoulders, kind of, um, uh, yeah, kind of about about midway up, kind of in the the trapezoids type area. Um, so that's that's where I would put a smaller canister. Yeah, that's right. So you want to so you're trying to balance the pack so it's not too heavy at the bottom or at the top. It's kind of all in the middle. And then so as you have that, how do you pack that? Because are these bags? I'm just thinking about how the bag is. Some of these bags you actually stuff them almost, but do a lot of these bags allow you to you know put your canister in the middle and then pack from the bottom and the top? Or how's that look? It all depends on the bag. A lot of these newer kind of ultralight Dyneema packs that are really trying to shave ounces um, often employ a roll top closure similar to like a dry bag, and there's only one way in and one way out. And then you also need to think strategically. It's another great reason to put your sleeping bag on the bottom because you probably don't need that until the very end of the day, you know, yeah. and then and then it gets tricky. Well, if you have to put your tent above your bear canister, you probably might need a snack before you need your tent. So, you know, just, just thinking about uh, also the order of what you need to access more frequently versus less frequently. You can always yeah. take your snacks and your lunch for the day out of the canister um, and kind of put that in the hip belt pockets. And then if you need to step away from your pack, you can always tuck that back into the canister um, so that it's secure. Uh, yeah. But other packs, like one of my favorite backpacks personally is I have an Osprey Aether pack, which is a pretty fully functional pack. It's got a lot of bells and whistles. Oh, and what's the name of that one? The Osprey? Osprey Aether. Oh, Aether. Yeah. They might have changed the name over the last few years, but yep. but it's kind of their their standard, really robust uh, backpacking Big bag pack. and it's it's got all sorts of zippers there's like a there's a, a separate zipper to access kind of that that bottommost compartment there's even a divider there and then there's another zipper that kind of comes down and you can really open up the whole pack and reach into the side nice so Love it that. all depends on on kind of what your goals are and, and how many features you want on your pack yep Gotcha. Okay. So, so I love that you're throwing out some names so we can start to think about this. So the Osprey is a good brand for sure. So you're going to have your sleeping bag and you could pack it down to the bottom unless you have something, right? It wouldn't be the end of the world if you did that. Maybe your tent's pretty heavy. So that you would want to maybe stuff above your uh, sleeping bag and kind of next to the bear vault. How'd that look? Exactly. It all depends on your tent, right? So if you have, you know, if you're really trying to shave ounces and you've got you know, something almost, you know, ultralight type bivy sack or 10, 20. What do you uh, use there, Grant? Do you go with like a bivy or do you actually have a nice big four season tent? I have a, uh, I have a tent that's actually what's called semi freestanding. It, uh, you, I, I love to hike with trekking poles. Um, and so what you do is uh, you stake out uh, the four corners of the tent and then you actually uh, take your trekking poles and break them down oh, yeah. a little bit. And they help extend the tent up, and then with with the trekking poles plus the tension from the the different stakes, the tent actually pops up and has a ton of headroom. But the oh, whole wow. tent is under two pounds, um, which is incredible. Damn. So how does that work when you get? I mean, would you be taking that out if you were potentially going into a big rainstorm sort of thing? Would that would that work okay? You know, if I was in the snow in true four season conditions, um, it would be it would be tough. But but really, I've had that tent. In some gnarly hailstorms, a couple of years ago, I was in Yosemite National Park um, during a, a really a period of, of some of the worst severe weather they had seen in years up there. It was, I think, one of the hailstorms hailed for for three hours straight. Damn! And I was wow. literally using my my shovel that I used to dig a cat hole for poop. I was using that to yep. shovel the the hail away from the tent because it was piling up six eight inches deep around the tent. I actually um, on that day I actually was struck by lightning. Um, what? And you were uh, personally? Yes, yes, I was. Um, and and but the tent held up. You know the tent the tent persevered through that. Um, even a lightweight tent like that, yeah. I mean, it doesn't, it's not the most confidence inspiring and high winds. And when the, when the hail starts to pile up or the rain, you start to, 
you know, it, you're not quite as confident as you might be in some North Face expedition tent. Yeah. But it's it's persevered it through surprisingly challenging conditions. It works. And and so I don't want to leave the, the, the struck by lightning. So <laughs> so let's hear that. Like literally, because I a lot of people probably haven't been struck by lightning. What what's that feel like? Yeah. So I um I was indirectly struck. It was during a terrible thunderstorm. Uh basically the hail was like quarter sized hail. I was in the lightning position. It struck a tree about 30-ish, 30 to 50 feet away from me, Um, came through, who knows, through the ground, through the air, um, through the moisture. But basically, um, first kind of was the light. It was just like blindingly bright. You know, you look at the sun and you kind of have um, like kind of like a spot in your eyes. After it happened, like I still had like just like kind of shapes and spots in my vision. Um, But then like uh imagine someone grabbed your hair and someone grabbed your feet and suddenly pulled the other way really abruptly that was what my whole whole body Jeez. did everything every muscle convulsed um and then and then there was just the loudest noise it was not even like um you know you have like an explosion your ears are ringing that it, you know it didn't even process that it was loud it was just my ears were just ringing and ringing and ringing and then i was just shaking and and I, at first i thought it was just cold it was super right. cold I, I wasn't dressed um for those kind of conditions um, you know, being ankle deep in hail and the air temperature was dropping probably into the forties. Yeah. Um, and, and at first I thought I was just cold, but then I realized I truly couldn't feel my hands and I tried to make fists and they would, they were just twitching. Uh, and it took about an hour or so to regain uh, full motor control of, wow. of my body. Holy cow. That sounds like a close call from death potentially, right? Yeah. I was really blessed to, to survive that encounter. Holy cow. Wow. So, and you said, uh, the put the uh, lightning position. Were you like in a position to uh, like what was that? Was that a thing you get in to avoid it? Yeah, it's basically just crouch down. You keep your feet together so that theoretically, if there was current running through the ground, it wouldn't run through one foot into the mm. other, or at least at, at minimize that. You kind of put your feet together. You crouch down, um, and then you can put your your hands over your you can put your hands over your ears to protect uh, yourself from from the the, the kind of the, the loud sound at that moment, I actually had my hands off my ears. And then if you have one of those foam style sleeping pads, oh, you yeah. also can sit or crouch on that as that will help insulate you from, from the ground. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. That's a, that is a crazy story. And thanks for sharing that. Um, a good tip there to remember, I guess, yeah, the, I guess the lightning position didn't work for you, but it, uh, it's a good thing to remember. You know, and it's hard to know. It could have definitely prevented seri- uh, more serious injury. It's just hard to know. Oh, sure. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you mentioned the pad because, in, again, the gear stuff, right? You got all this stuff. The pad is interesting because, you know, back in the day when I did, actually, I still have the Thermarest, but I'm finding that some of the inflatable pads maybe aren't as effective. Do you like the foam pad? Is that the better way to go now? I I actually i am a bit of a side sleeper, and, mm. uh, and as, I would love to... I would love to love one of those uh, those closed cell foam pads because they're light, they're indestructible. You know, when you're cooking dinner, you yep. can throw it on a rock and hang out and sit on it, and you can't you can't break the thing. Um, yep. But you know, when I sleep on my side, I just I just can't go get a Too good night's weight. sleep. So yep. um, you know, while they don't offer the same durability, um, you know these these inflatable pads are are getting so light. And oh, they're they're quick now. to to blow up. Yeah, you know, so so the the leading market closed cell phone pads uh, are around thirteen to fifteen ounces, so just shy of a pound. And I have a really nice. I have a, what's called a Nemo Tensor Ultralight. It's a it's an inflatable pad. It's uh, about three inches thick. So even on my side, you know, don't touch the ground. It's insulated yeah. to a comparable R value of insulation. And it's only mm. 16, 17 ounces. So um, less than a quarter of a pound heavier. Wow. Yeah, that's it. And and I used one on a trip. We were up in Alaska and the outfitter had, I think, something similar. And they were really sweet. They were totally lightweight. And I remember I grabbed them. I was like, wow, this thing packs up into about the size of a, you know, like a, a, a I don't know, like a cantaloupe, even smaller than a cantaloupe. Yeah. And I was like, wow, yeah. this is tiny. Because they, back in the day, I mean, the, the old Thermarest, and I'm sure Thermarest has their own style now, but... You know, we still have those old pads we use on our boat trips, and they're they're gigantic. Oh right? my goodness! They're, you know, you're hanging yeah. off the bottom of your pack, and it's exactly. like the, it's like a big, huge like sleeping roll. I know the one that I have is is you know probably about the size of a like a sixteen uh, ounce, like a half liter Nalgene. You know, it's, it's tiny it's and, it's, and it weighs nothing. 
You know what I love about this too for me is that we've been talking about this for a while with the, with the kids, right? We got these kids that they're they're getting older, they're eight and ten, and we just we've been talking about for a few years, like God, we got to do some backpacking. Trips. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And we just haven't done it. We do a lot, of, tons of hiking. We're out there all the time hiking, but we just haven't done the overnight stuff just because partly the gear thing. But I think given that stuff's new, I think we need to take a tour of the store, right? Out, you know, just hit an outdoor store and be like, okay, let's get the bait because it sounds like the kids can carry their own stuff pretty easy. For sure, no. With with the with the improvements in weight savings on this gear, you know, you can you can get a kids pack down to to really not that much more than than a day pack, oh, and wow. and and you know the kids are not they're not miserable they're not crying they're actually having a positive yep. a positive time and a great this experience. Is so cool. And uh, we're we're really encouraged by that. And the other end of it too, the same goes actually for for older folks. We're we're really seeing the advancements in gear are giving people that are getting older that, you know, they, they might not have the mobility or the, the endurance that they used to, but, you know, they're able to get lighter gear that uh, just takes so much load off of, off of an aging back. Mm. And, and people are getting out and going to places that they, they didn't think they would be able to reach at the age they're at. That's a great point. What do you recommend? Is it just go to the you know, if you got an REI or whatever outdoor store, just go there. Is that the better thing to do and just dig into their stuff? Or do you think you can go online and be like, hey, I need this stuff. They can just get it all there. I think it all depends on your style. There's so many great blogs out there these days that, that go into the nitty gritty of every piece of gear and, you know, will side by side compare it and stress test it. Um, yep. But there's something too about going into, uh, you know, a store like an REI uh, and yeah. feeling it. But above all, my favorite, and not not every not every city or town has this, but um, like for instance, I live in in Boulder, Colorado, and we have a recycled gear store where people go and they can sign their gear. You know, they 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 often have really nice gear, but they want you know the the Ferrari of backpacks. You know, they they had the Porsche of backpacks, but now <laughs> they want the Ferrari. Um, yeah. And uh, and you know, you you get it you know lightly used for. 60% off of what it originally cost. And it's amazing, you know, the quality of, of gear you can get. Um, and really, you know, really recycling that gear, not, you know, not uh, having unnecessary gear manufactured or winding up in the landfill. All right. Yeah, I love it. Well, let, let's take it to, again, so we've talked about some gear, you know, we're not going to cover everything today on all of the gear and stuff and packing, but just tell us like a resource. You mentioned, is there a blog or something comes to mind where if somebody wanted to really dig in and find out what is the ultra light stuff or just the gear they can get if they're, if they need to get it all, where, where would you send them? Absolutely. My personal favorite is there's a website called outdoor gear lab Oh yeah. and they definitely yeah, emphasize, huge. um, you know, some fancier gear, but I think they take honestly a pretty, uh, pretty almost scientific approach and kind of put gear head to head and rank it on a variety of, you know, important factors. And I, it's, it's a way that I've selected some of my favorite gear. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And I think they do, you could probably go in there and talk, you know, ultra light, whatever. Right. And they'll give you the lightest and all that stuff. So that's a great Precisely. resource. Okay. Okay. So let's get back to the pack. So we got our bag. Let's just imagine we got this Osprey pack and it's, it's big enough that, you know, we can do a big multi day trip, but say we're still in that two day, two night range. So what was the bear vault you would recommend for that? Is the, is the 500 the one or would you go a little smaller? So really the key is, is, is when I think about choosing a canister, it depends on the number of people I'm backpacking with and how I like to cook. So um, if I'm going out with a buddy for two nights, we could either share perhaps a Bear Vault BV450 or a Bear Vault 475. Right. But yeah. also, you know, I like sometimes to keep my snacks mine. I don't want people snacking on my beef jerky. Right. So no. uh, I might take my own, my own canister and uh, our smallest size, the uh, BV425 Sprint um, is great for one to two nights. I've even squeezed three in there when I was really – really intentional about the packing of it. Um, and so the other thing too is, you know, how do you like to cook? So um, I am really serious about saving as much weight as I can and getting like the most bang for my buck, the most calories out of that space. And so I often can bring uh, a smaller canister. However, some people love to be the backcountry chef. You know, you can't believe it. They've pa they've hiked ten miles in. They open it up and they've got like a fresh bell pepper. You're like, where'd that come oh, from? Wow. And then you know they pull out an avocado and somehow it's not like <laughs> brown and like smashed. You're like, how did you pull that off? And nice. so you know, some people 
love to like cook and cook elaborately in the back country. And so if you're doing that, you know, you're probably going to need a bigger canister. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. So, so if you're doing the, like, I mean, my experience is like, okay, I've got the freeze dried meals, you know, which, which I always loved, you know, for dinner, I've got what even breakfast maybe. And then, so that's lightweight stuff. And on those freeze dried meals now, are you sticking those in the bear canister as well? Is that, does that all go there? My secret tip on the freeze dried meals is the, the, the packaging they use is, is actually pretty thick. It's pretty stout. Um, cause I guess, cause it needs to be good until 2045 mm. or whenever they expire. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it actually, when you, you roll them up, that packaging actually takes up quite a bit of space, quite a bit of air volume. Um, so what I do is I actually take, uh, like a Ziploc freezer bag and I will, before my trip, I will open up on the day before the trip or whatever, I'll open up the mountain house or backpackers pantry or, or whatever that freeze dried food is. Yeah. And I'll pour it into a Ziploc bag and I'll suck all the air out and it packs down to about half the size. Huh. Um, and, and you just, you get a huge savings of weight and the, the bags that are rated to freezer quality, um, make sure you get one that does not have BPA in it, but they actually not only freezing temperatures, but they can also handle boiling temperatures. So I'll actually cook my mountain house food directly in the freezer bag. And then I'm not having to clean out a pot oh, or wow. anything like that. So you'll cook it in, you'll pour the hot water into like the, the Ziploc bag directly into a uh, a Ziploc bag. Yep. A heavy duty one, right? Oh, that's not BPA. Yep. And even even in cold weather, it, it doesn't cool off super fast or anything. It's not oh, like wow. your food's going to be cold. Um, it's not bad at all. That's good to know. Yeah. Because you think the packages, they come in, they say they you put them in there and they keep them, you know, leave them in there for 10 minutes, right? And they stay warm. But you're right. saying a Ziploc is just, it just as good. Exactly. And I've always believed they, they, even at high altitude, they cook a lot faster than the companies say they do. Yeah, they do. Um, that, that's always been my, my perception. Yeah, they do. Yeah, you don't have to wait 10 minutes. If you're hungry, if you're hungry, dig into that. I'm Go for always it. digging yeah. it early. Especially if you like it a little crunchy, you know, really, yeah, the crunchy. really dig right in. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. And then you got all your other gear, like you said, you got, I mean, I, my, my luxury food was always, I'd bring a little bit of cheese head, right? For the first mm, day or whatever. Like so a little I'd Romano little, or, uh, yeah. Mm, yeah, good stuff. exactly. A little cheese. And then the, obviously the beef jerky, if it wasn't like, uh, you know, like $50 a pound, I'd bring more. <laughs> that's, that's so always you got to protect it, you know? I know. Okay, good. So then what else? Let's just take it back to the pack and, and we're going to take it out here. I'm glad we're talking, uh, glad we're talking about food because we're going to dig back into food before we get out, but just on the packing of the bag. So we've talked about a lot of the stuff. There's a lot of little things that go along this with this, you know, the first aid kit and, and everything else. But Talk about pack. anything we missed, missed on packing. Do we just remember that we pack the heavy stuff against our back in the middle, everything else goes around it, or do you want to give us any more tips on how you actually pack that bag? I think that's a really good place to start. Um, and then I think the next thing is is there's kind of uh, – there's sort of a, a graph, a continuum between like efficiency and comfort, right? And, and it's really what are your goals. You know, if you want to hike – two, three, four miles into the back country and really like set up your base camp, you know, and you've got, mm. you know, you're, you're running your own little mini outfitter fishing camp back there, basically. Yep. That's great. And that, if that's what you want to do, that's awesome. Um, and you can bring, you know, they've got these crazy lightweight chairs, they've got hammocks. Mm. I mean, no it's kidding. amazing the, the wow. luxuries you can bring back there. Right. But also if you want to go, 20 miles in a single day back to that spot that nobody else is fishing. I mean, those fish are so unpressured. Then, yeah. you know, you have to really get serious about the gear and, and you'd have to make some sacrifices. You know, I, I've started bringing a lot less clothing than I used to, or, um, you know, you might not be able to bring that float tube, you know, or, yeah. uh, you know, you might, uh, start to look at getting, a, a down uh, quilt instead of a synthetic sleeping bag, right? There's oh, a wow. lot of things you can do that, that it, you know, it might only be five, six ounces per item, but suddenly you've shaved five, six ounces off of, uh, you know, off of a lot of items. And it's amazing how light your pack can be. So my pack consistently, Dave, when I go out for, on average, my usual backpacking trip is about three, four days. And, and before I, I add in the, the weight of food and water, my yeah. pack, including the bear canister is right around 12 pounds. Wow. And that's for Holy solo, cow. that's for solo travel. Damn. 12 pounds. That seems unbelievable. So, but the great thing about that is, is that that's exactly when I want to give my kids. Exactly. Yeah. 
and theirs could be even lighter because they don't need an adult size sleeping bag. Their their down jacket is smaller, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's wow. it's amazing. This is really cool. Yeah, and we got all the gear, of course, the clothing, and we're like we said, we're not going to dig into everything, but there's a bunch of reasons. And I think the outdoor gear lab is is a great one, and uh, the trekking pools, and the, you know, there's all sorts of cool things. So this is just like a a step to get people thinking. Like I love the way you said too, if you're older. This is a great opportunity. Like maybe people think like, man, I, I can't carry a heavy pack. Well, 12 pounds. I mean, I think most people could carry a 12 or even a 20 pound pack, right? Exactly. Absolutely. This is good. And then the bear vault itself is is a very heavy duty, uh, you know, item, but it's not super heavy, like heavy weight wise, right? What is the, what is the bear vault? Uh, what does that thing weigh empty? Yeah. So it depends on the size. Um, but basically our smallest size is just a little bit under two pounds and our biggest size is just a bit under three pounds yeah. to give you some context there. We've, we've refined it over the years. We've continued to work on the design and, and basically we've gotten this thing as, as thin as light as absolutely possible while still, you know, keeping strong, keeping the bears out because we recognize it. We don't, you, you, you don't want to carry extra weight. Yeah. So we've, we've milled off every, every possible ounce. And I mean, not even ounce. We've we've gotten down to the gram, the gram many times, and and we are very specific about how many grams the product is, and uh, and how to make it as as efficient as possible yeah. for our users. That's really cool. What's um? Well, I just want to go down the gear just really quick again. So because you have this twelve pound pack uh, without food or water, what are your? I can you just give us a rundown and maybe talk because you talked about some like the ultralight um, pad, you right? The company and you talked about your. Your tent, which is another great, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of the, what else is in your pack that that's rounding out the 12 pounds. So, so really the the four the four biggest things that you can think about, um, you can really think about it as your big four. Um, that is your sleeping bag, your tent, your backpack and your sleeping pad, okay? Yeah. And those are the areas where you can have the biggest weight savings. Oh, cool. um, everything beyond that is gonna be kind of a couple ounces here, a couple ounces there. And it's really more about the items you're not bringing than the quality of the items you are bringing. For sleeping bag, I carry actually an REI sleeping bag. It's got really high quality down, comes in just a little bit under two pounds and it's rated to 15, 15 degrees. Um, sleeping uh, pad, we were talking about that earlier, and I use a um, uh, Nemo Tensor Insulated uh, Inflatable Pad. Um, tent, I use that semi-freestanding tent. There's quite a few on the market, uh, that model, and it comes in just a little bit under two pounds. And lastly, I use a Dyneema pack with a roll-top style, um, 45 liters, and that comes in uh, just a little bit, uh, under two pounds. Also, I have a couple, couple pack styles that I love. Um, one of my favorites is ULA packs. They're made in Utah, um, handmade with just really quality, uh, Dyneema and, uh, ultralight materials. And then really everything beyond that is, is pretty, pretty optional. As long as you're being responsible, there's, there's kind of, I have this idea of, of what it is to be responsible ultralight because you don't want to pare down your gear so much that the thunderstorm comes up or that yeah. fall snowstorm comes along and, and you're the guy that gets pulled out of there by search and rescue because right. you didn't plan, you know? Or you're freezing or you can't even sleep at night because you're so cold. Exactly. And, and it's just, it's not a fun experience, right? Like, I, I mean, I love some good type two fun, but, yeah. uh, but we all know that it has to be enjoyable at some level. So, yeah. um, so you know, I'm I'm always bringing a down jacket. I'm bringing uh, really lightweight rain gear, uh, both pants and rain jacket. Um, but perhaps most importantly, um, I'm also bringing a satellite communicator. Mm. Um, I think that's a really great tool that we have the option to use in this day and age. And uh, they're light. There's no reason not to use it. Um, and then I think ultimately uh, a bear canister has really become a, a huge part of, of what it means to be responsible ultralight. You know, I am in the back country. I have a duty to respect this place that I am a part of. It's a duty to respect the wildlife there. Um, and a bear canister is, is really just the best way to do that. So um, yeah. that's kind of the other key piece of, of being yeah. responsible ultralight. 
Do you take your stuff out so when you have your food scraps, you probably don't have much, but do you just put it back in the bear canister if you have any? Absolutely. Yeah. First and foremost, try to eat everything um, and, and, you know, planning meals out so that you can, you can eat it out all. And then, you know, any, any trash, um, any food scraps uh, goes back in the canister. If, if there's a lot of like liquid, like let's say you have, um, you've made pasta. Um, I, I love to make pesto pasta when I'm backpacking mm, and you yeah. get the, you get the water um, that basically was in the, the pasta that you used to boil it yep. in. So what I do is I strain that out and then there's a, a technique called broadcasting it. That's a fancy yeah. name for you. Just you spread spray it. it as wide as you can and spread yeah. it out. I mean, don't do it on the trail. Don't do it right next to a body of water. Um, right. Don't do it right next to your tent, but just no. <laughs> spread it out and it's fine. Um, yeah. But if there's actually food chunks in it, you want to pack that out. Yeah. Pack that out. That's it. Gotcha. Okay. So good. So you're literally, yeah, you're down to like right there, the, those items and the, your pad, what does that thing weigh? Like less than a pound? Yeah. Right around a pound. A pound. Yeah. So basically you got, you know, two, four, six, uh, seven, and then plus, you know, the, the canister that's eight. Nine. So you're like kind of nine pounds with the big items. Exactly. And everything else. You got it. Three more pounds of just your missile. I mean, really your clothes, you must have some pretty lightweight clothes too. If you're keeping absolutely them. my, my rain, uh, my rain pants, my rain jacket total, about eight ounces. Um, my down jackets, right. About six ounces. So it, you know, it's, it, it, it starts to add up yep. slower on those, those items. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Cool. And then, like we said, just packing it, you got all that stuff. Now you know what your heavy stuff is and pack that either around. Yeah. Like you said, next to your back in the middle and then, and then spread it out lighter from there. Well, let's take it out. We, the, the food and food choice and caloric intake, right? That's a big part of this because if you smart about it, you know, you could get a bunch of crap and, and, and have to carry a lot of food or you could probably get the right food where you don't have to eat as much. Let's talk about that. I think that's where you're going with this, right? Absolutely. I think this is one of the biggest places that people can improve on their packing. And you really don't have to spend very much money. You're going to buy food no matter what. Um, you know, whereas a new sleeping bag, you know, cost uh, top of the line sleeping bag could run you $600, right? But yeah. food, anybody can, anybody can tackle this. So, you know, I, I thought I was bringing good food when I first started backpacking. I thought tuna packets were awesome. Right. You know, they they pack so tightly, you know, there's like no extra airspace. You can line those puppies up, you know, but then I, I really learned about this concept of caloric and volumetric density, right? So volumetric density, that's how we normally think of, of density, right? Uh, you know, lead is more dense than styrofoam, right? In the same amount of area, you're getting more weight packed in there, right? So if you're bringing hot flaming Cheetos, that are full of airspace. Those have really poor uh, volumetric density, right? Whereas if you're packing uh, tuna packets, right? Tuna packets have great volumetric density. They're super dense and packable, right? But the other idea of it is caloric density. And that is the measure of calories per ounce, right? So the, uh, the Cheetos actually might be pretty uh, calorically dense, right? Because they weigh nothing, right? But because yeah. they got all those good processed foods, they might be three, four hundred calories, um, you know, for only an ounce or two. All right. But the key is is finding foods. There's a small selection of foods that are both calorically dense and volumetrically dense, and it might surprise you. So tuna, right? That's really volumetrically dense. Actually, if you look at the back. It has very few calories. You're not getting very much nutrition. Your best packet of tuna is is probably 70, 80 calories. That's like half the calories in a cliff bar, for instance. And it's yep. heavy. There's a ton of water in there, right? The more water you have in your food, there's no calories in water. That's excess, um, mm. excess weight. So you have to figure out foods that don't have water and really have an emphasis on fat. You know, the great thing is when you're backpacking, you're actually doing metabolism that burns fat really well. You're getting exercise. Don't stress the fat too much. Um, yeah. I'm forgetting the exact numbers, but basically fat has, as you know, upwards of three times the calories per gram of weight. Oh, so, right. so for instance, so like the, the king of them all, when I go backpacking, I actually take a small little container of olive oil, okay? And when I have like a mountain house type or other freeze dried or dehydrated meal, I'll usually pour an ounce or so of, of olive oil on it. 
and that is 240 calories in every ounce. Oh, wow. It's one of the most calorically dense foods you'll find. And, and I love because it's oil. a liquid, it's volumetrically dense, right? It takes up almost yeah. no space in your pack. Um, but generally, your, your free-dried foods are going to be uh, advantageous. Um, you can even purchase uh, grains that would normally have to be cooked but are actually dehydrated. So uh, that, that way you use less fuel to cook it. So you can find like quinoa grains that have been – uh, cooked, right? Rehydrated and then dehydrated again. So all you have to do is just heat them back up and put a little bit of water in, but you get huge weight savings. Mm, this is awesome. So the key is, is finding things that are both calorically, uh, dense and volumetrically dense. I was packing for, um, a 250 mile backpacking trip, uh, a couple of years ago. And I was having to get really serious about my packing and figuring out I was going to fit it all in the bear canister. And, um, through really making wise food choices, not only was I able to fit it all in, but I estimate that for each seven day period, I was able to save about five pounds in food. And so, you know, we're talking about cutting ounces or grams with, you know, oh, you know, pick, you know, break your toothbrush in half. You know, I'll be the right. first to admit my toothbrush is broken in half, but yep. you know, sure. that that's, that's a uh, half an ounce, right? That's, that's, that's nothing. But when, when you talk about saving five pounds of food, but giving the same amount of calories, that's a game changer. Yeah, that is. That is that's a huge tip. I love the olive oil tip because that's something I love. Where would somebody go on this end if they want to really figure out what foods are the best to bring? Is there a resource out there you know of? If you want to really get into the weeds about it, if you if you're if you're serious about this and 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 you want to like really uh really take some time and digest what this means, there's actually a YouTube series out there called um the gear skeptic, just look it up on YouTube. Mm. And okay. this guy has a spreadsheet with about a thousand lines. And he's listed out almost every conceivable food in there that you could imagine uh, backpacking with. And he has the weight, the volume, the calories, the fats, the proteins, the, all, all the numbers. And you can really build out a menu for yourself uh, within that and, and come out with, with foods. You know, if you think about bringing beef jerky, not all beef jerky is created equally. There's some beef jerky that's more calorically dense than other beef jerky. So um, you really can make some wise choices and and save a lot of stress on your back. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, the, the, the gear skeptic. I'll put a link in the show notes to that as well. And the other stuff we talked about today. This is good. I think we have a good, uh, you know, rounding this out, you know, just on getting light because the cool thing about getting light here is is that the lighter you are with all everything we're talking about that means that you're not as bad carrying a fly rod or even you know an extra reel or something like that that's the Absolutely. cool thing is that it allows yep. you to so my pack i remember back in the day when i used to do more of it you know my pack i don't even know what it weighed right it was probably 50 pounds you know and then of course the float tube but you don't really that's the cool thing about especially your fishing lakes you don't have to have a float tube right you can actually fish off the bank a lot of times and the stuff is so light the rod the the flies it is pretty doable totally. so this makes it i mean i think you could do i mean maybe not 250 miles that's pretty epic but you know you could do a multi-day trip for sure like a week and, and just bust it out with your fly gear these days so absolutely and even if you have a float tube you know if you if you get serious about reducing your weight it's not so bad to bring that float tube you know i i grew up in uh in idaho with you know there's there's this range called the sawtooth range there that's got just you know these amazing rugged alpine lakes and and a lot of them have these just gnarly trails or no trail at all to get up to these lakes where there's just you know just a phenomenal brook trout or even some bigger fish and uh you know and and it would be pretty unfeasible to get up to those lakes with a heavy pack and a float tube unless you really got serious about um, about your pack weight. Gotcha. Yeah, and I was just going to give a shout out to, uh, we did an episode quite a while back on, um, uh, this was with uh, Phil Hayes, Ultralight Boats, and he broke down his float tube. There are some tubes out there that are super light too, so it, it is even in that phase, you know, there's a guy, and he's a special specialty, so I'll, we'll have a link to that one so people can check out as well. For sure. Nice, Grant. Well, I, I, this has been awesome. I think uh, we've given uh, everybody a good taste of, you know, how not only the gear, but how to be ultra light and, uh, and get out there. So, 
you know, I think there's no excuses now, right? Whether you're a kid, you got a six-year-old kid or, or whether you're, you know, older person, I think everybody can do it these days. Seems like it. Exactly. And you can do it while being responsible and, and ultimately protecting the wildlife around you too with a bear canister. Perfect. That's right. Well, we'll, we'll send everybody out to bearvault.com to uh, check that out because obviously, you know, that, you know, for sure in those places where there's lots of bears, that's just a requirement, but there's a lot of other areas where you might need it. Like you said, critters and, you know, all sorts of mice. I mean, whatever, you know, you hate to wake up in the morning and all of a sudden, geez, you know, some mice got in your stuff and, and ate your, uh, right, ate your dinners for the week. That, that would be a good situation. Yep. Absolutely. So, okay. All right, Grant. Well, thanks again for the time and we'll uh, definitely uh, keep in touch with you here uh, moving forward. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the knowledge. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on the podcast, Dave. So there it is. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash backpack right now. And you can check out all the show notes for this episode and uh, and get all those links. We'll have a couple of videos over there as well, showing you digging in a little bit deeper into what we talked about today. This is a great time to give a shout out to an upcoming series we have going, which is Falls in Line, similarly to a lot of the outdoor stuff we have going. Uh, this is The Road Less Traveled, and uh, we're going to be digging in to a bunch of the uh, names, faces, and brands uh, around eastern Idaho and a focus on hiking, fishing, traveling, and just all the people out there in that region. So this is, uh, this is traveled, so get ready for that. It's going to be coming up soon, The Road Less Traveled, and uh, we're going to be excited to dig into some of those people. We've, we've talked to a bunch of people already uh, in and around the area. Obviously, it's a hot spot, we're gonna, but we're going to do a deep dive and, uh, and provide some opportunities to learn more about this uh, part of the country. If you're heading into the backcountry right now, grab your bear vault. That's the best opportunity to get what you need to protect your provisions from bears and other critters while out in the woods. We've talked about this before, so if you need something, if you ever had that, or if you're going into a national park, anything, the bear vault is the way, is what you need to get started. All right, we're going to head out of here. This was a great uh, little uh, bonus episode we tossed in here, so I'm excited to do more of these. Um, definitely going to get the kids out as we talked about today. Getting the kids out on the trail is going to be huge, and we're going to get some backpacking, some uh, multi-day backpacking in. So time to hit the gear shop, time to look up that outdoor store, and I'm not sure where we're going to start, but uh, that's where I'm heading uh, this week. I'm going to make a note. Uh, might be REI, uh, maybe one of the other outdoor stores, but we're going to check into it. I already have the pad I know in mind. We're out with Fishhound Expeditions. They had some lightweight pads that we were using that were super awesome, and I think that's the um, that's the style we're looking for. Sleeping bags, tents. I like how Grant went into on this one. He was talking about the uh, the trekking poles. What a sweet idea, right? Trekking poles. I mean, if you're summer camping, or even maybe some a little bit heavier duty stuff, the trekking poles with one of those lightweight shelters. That's huge. And then the food, of course. Um, you know, it just seems like we're building everything we have around our sponsors. A range meal bars pack 700 calories into one of their bars. I mean, you could literally take uh, on a three day trip, take three of those bars. I mean, that's like three meals right there. So um, that's kind of what I'm going towards. And then, and of course, the olive oil trick. I love the olive oil trick. That was another good one by Grant, um, getting some bonus calories there. So it all it's all coming together. And as we move ahead into the new year uh, here soon, we're going to be digging into more of this and helping everybody, whether you're getting out fishing or hunting, uh, whatever you're doing out there, getting on the trail, we're going to be providing the resources to, uh, to get you started. All right. Well, I'm going to get out of here. I hope to catch you maybe on the trail uh, or maybe on the water. Anytime you can connect with me, Dave at wetflyswing.com or on social media, wetflyswing. If you want to connect or if you have an episode idea to connect with me, let me know. That'd be great. And I am heading out. It is getting, uh, it's, it's not super late yet in the evening, but it's going to be getting late. So, um, so I hope if it is evening, you're having a good evening, a good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And I look forward to catching up with you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.